This series has been impactful for anybody else. Uh, love what God's doing in our church right now and in so many of you. And you know, I was thinking this past week that I, I've been really surprised about something. Jamie and I have discovered there's something we like doing together, almost a hobby that I would have never thought about, and that is we like going to the gym and working out together. It's kind of strange. I, I think I would have never thought about that. I don't think in our 20s we could have done it. I think we would have like butted heads too much. She'd have been like, you're bossing me around. And I'd be like, Arr. you know, and so I, but today we kind of just go, we have fun. We see things the same way and we love doing kind of the same things except for one thing. There's one thing at the gym, and it's my problem, all right, and it, it has everything to do with Jamie on the treadmill, okay? When we get on the treadmill, um, I like to stay at flat, and Jamie says you should always go at incline. So I've got this treadmill completely in incline mode, so make it out fall here, and like, have you ever been on a treadmill in incline mode? This thing will like wear you out fast. And so Jamie's like, you should go in incline mode. And I'm like, no, I'm going on flat. And she's like, go in incline mode. And I'm like, I do it in incline mode. And just even right now, this thing's on incline. It's probably not even that much. I just want to get off it. I mean, I'm already like, I'm already winded a little bit, you know? Anybody else? Are there any sickos out there you love going incline mode? Anybody else out there? How many of you? You're sick, okay? (laughs) Um, Before this service, I was talking to Jamie and she said, I just believe if you're going to get on the treadmill, you should be in inclined mode. And I'm like, well, I like to be, you know, how many of you like to be in flat like me? Anybody else out there? How many of you are like, I don't want to get on a treadmill at all? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. I think this is a little bit of a picture of life. My problem on the treadmill is some of us, our problem in life. See, we live in an uphill world. And most of us expect a downhill life. We think life should be easy. And I just want to ask you, what is one thing in your life, one good thing in your life that hasn't been uphill to get there? Like one thing. I mean, that degree you, you got or you're in the middle of right now, it's uphill, right? Um, succeeding in the business world or in your career. I mean, that's oftentimes so uphill. Uh, how about overcoming some pain from your past. That can be very uphill to get past some of the real hurtful things that have happened in our past. Hey, any parents in the room, is is raising a newborn easy? Those sleepless, crying nights, and then you get through that, which is totally uphill, and then you have a toddler, congratulations, you know? That's uphill, and then you get a teenager, and then you get a young adult, and you're like, I didn't expect a young adult. It's, it's all uphill. Hey, how about just being married? Do not elbow the person next to you. You know, it's like <laughs> marriage, I don't care what anybody says, to have a great marriage, man, that is an uphill climb that takes some perseverance and grit on your part. Hey, how about just living in a world that is falling away from Christian values and trying to stay strong in your faith? Every single one of us has to develop perseverance or grit to get through this uphill world. John Maxwell uh, has one of the greatest quotes I love. He actually says this. He says, most people have uphill hopes and downhill habits. And I think that's so true. Most of us like, yeah, and then we like want it easy. So I think many of us today need to develop what's called perseverance, or I like the word grit. We will interchange them today. Here's kind of my favorite definition of grit. Grit is the strength to get up one more time than you get knocked down. It's, it's the character or the inward quality that you can push through some of the pain or the tough times in life and not give up. And the question I wanna ask you today as we start is this. How easy is it for you when life gets hard to quit? I don't mean what you hope it would be or your intentions. I mean, what do your actions say? Like if you looked at your resume, how many times when a job got hard did you just quit and walk away? If you look at your school transcripts, how many classes did you drop because it just got too hard? If you look at a relationship inventory of your life, how many times did you just kind of churn through relationships because it just got too difficult? How many times have you made a commitment that I'm going to diet, I'm going to start working out, I'm going to start reading scripture more, and then it just got a little hard, and you're like, I'm out. 
If you know you have some work to do in this area, and I think many of us do, today's declaration is for you. And just like every week, I'm going to give you the declaration up front. I'm going to look at it biblically because the Bible has so much to say about this one. And then I'm going to give you a chance at the end of the message to make a declaration that I believe can be a line in the sand that can change your life. Here's our declaration for today. This year, with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, I will develop godly grit. Most people give up when life gets hard. I'm not most people. If I commit, I won't quit. Now, I wish I could stand before you today as your pastor and say that I I haven't really struggled with this declaration. And I don't struggle with this declaration, but that wouldn't be true. And the only way I know how to preach is to be real and transparent. I don't know any other way to do it. And so just to be real today, um, I joined the staff of CCV in 2007, and I'm going to read you a journal entry that I wrote on March 4th, 2009 at 8.31 a.m. This is two years after I had joined and gone on staff. I wrote this, should I leave CCV Should I quit? And I gave a lot of reasons of just why really what was going on inside of me was I had gone into ministry and and started working in in, in the church and I'd realized it was a lot harder than I could have ever imagined. And I felt exhausted, I felt worn out and I just wondered, like I wonder if I should just call it or do something else. I get emotional today thinking about what hung in the balance. Not not for our church, because listen, if I left, God will find somebody else. You understand that, right? That's how God works. I mean for like me and what God wanted to do in my life and the perseverance he wanted to develop in me. And I just know that I need this declaration, and I know many of us here know we need this declaration to do. In fact, I think God has someone here today. God has you here today because he wants to get up in your grill and say, you have no idea. Like, you have no idea what hangs in the balance of you learning to develop godly grit in your life. And what I love is God's word has so much to say on this topic. In fact, I love also that the recent scientific and research community has finally caught up with what God's word has been saying for thousands of years. If you've never read any of her research, Angela Duckworth has probably done the most research on grit. She's a Harvard graduate. She got a degree in neurobiology. She has a PhD now. And she wrote a book on grit. And she argues, I think effectively, and with data that she says this, the one characteristic that separates successful from unsuccessful people is not IQ, it's not talent, it's not your upbringing. She argues it's grit. And I think she's right. In fact, did you know the Bible would say something very similar? What if I told you that scripture said developing godly grit is the key to you getting to a place in life where you lack nothing. You'd be like, does it really say that? Let me read it to you. James chapter one, starting in verse two, James, the brother of Jesus writes this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You're like, why on earth would I consider it joy when I have to go through uphill hard things in life? He goes on in verse three, he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? perseverance, this thing we all need, that when I'm tested and uphill and I don't give up, it starts to develop something in me, which is perseverance. And then watch what he says next. This is unbelievable. Verse four, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking what? Anything. That is a mind blowing principle to me that If you look at this verse again, just look at the end of that verse, that you can get to a place where you're mature and complete to a point where you lack nothing. You're like, how on earth could that be? It's because when we develop perseverance, we can get to a place where, man, this uphill life and the things that life throws at us, it doesn't rattle us the way it does so many people. 
but it comes down to perseverance and grit. And James tells us there's a process to perseverance and grit. When he says the words mature and complete, those two Greek words together, they really tell us and imply that this is a process. Maturity is a process, right? Becoming complete is a process. And so there's a process to developing grit that I want to talk to you about today because I do not believe that you were just born with grit. Like, I don't think a baby's born and they're like, oh, this baby's gritty. Yeah. No, I, th- I think this is something that is a, it's a, it's like a muscle. We have to develop it. We have to let it grow in our lives to develop grit. I mean, our environment sh- for sure affects our, our grit sometimes or how we were raised. For example, if you were raised and you played on sports teams where like, whether you won a game or you lost every single game, they gave you a trophy at the end and you're like, you won the championship. You're like, you didn't win jack, okay, but you still got a trophy, all right? Now, if that was kind of your life growing up, then when the real world hits, it might be a little harder for you, right? When you're like, but I thought everybody won. No buttercup. That's not how it works in the real world, okay? <laughs> now, our environment affects, but I really believe outside of that, there really is a process that all of us can develop grit. So I want to talk to you about today three principles for developing grit. Now, this isn't comprehensive. There's so much more to say on this, but I think these are three of the most important principles. And if you're taking notes, I hope you are. Here's number one. we got to set our mindset. We're going to set your mindset, my mindset, your mindset. Here's our mindset. Everything worthwhile in life is uphill. And we're told almost the exact opposite all the time. Like, well, life should be easy. No, everything worthwhile in your life is uphill. And you got to set your mindset to this, or when hard things happen, this is kind of like the criticism message. Remember I told you with criticism, sometimes we're going to expect it so we can more effectively deal with it. It's the same thing with developing grit. we got to expect that hard things are going to come. Right, remember our key verse in James chapter one. James says what? He says, consider. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. The word consider in the Greek is a a thinking word. It's a mind word. It's a mindset that we begin to develop. That's what scripture tells us. And what is our mindset gonna be? James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. What's the next word in the bold? Say it out loud. Say it again. Whenever. He doesn't say if you face trials of many kinds. Do you understand the difference? He says when. What is my mindset? Not if I have an uphill challenge at times, but that it is coming. And if you do that, then when you face these hard times, you don't walk away from your faith, get mad at God and say, why is something happening to me? I thought life was supposed to be easy. Hey, who told you life was gonna be easy? Whoever it was, they lied to you. And by the way, you know, sometimes you'll hear like some preachers or pastors say like, well, if you just do X, Y, Z, God will bless you and it'll be easy. Wrong. That is not biblical, by the way. Not even close. In fact, listen to the words of Jesus. This is Jesus himself. Jesus in John chapter 16 says this, in this world, you will have trouble. Like how much more clear is it than that? But then, praise God, he goes on to say, say this, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. In other words, with Jesus, there's nothing this world can throw at us. There's no uphill that's too hard for Jesus to come alongside and help you through it. You know the only people I know in the world that tell you life should be easy? is people that want to sell you something. Well, if you just buy this car or get this house or, you know, go on this vacation or get in this career track, you'll be, it'll, life will be so easy. They're liars. They're lying. There's no such thing that will give you an easy life forever. In fact, do you know sometimes the more stuff you have, the more problems you have? That's where some of you are. You thought, well, I have more than I ever thought I have in my life, and yet it's it's still uphill. That's right, because the uphill never goes away. And don't, don't you, you just can't ever believe that. So what is our mindset? Our mindset is everything worthwhile in life is uphill, and hard times come for everyone, and I'll be a person of grit. And listen, I need this. You need this. I told you last year that out of the blue, my wife, who is so healthy, was diagnosed with cancer. And man, it it hit our family like a ton of bricks. It hit me like a ton of bricks. It hit Jamie like a ton of bricks. And we had to make a decision, like, are we going to pout and say, this is so unfair? 
Or are we going to have perseverance through this and keep trusting God? And I praise God that, that we've taken that mindset because he's really done some things in our life that I don't think would have ever happened if we weren't going through this. God works through our pain whether we like it or not. And, you know, just to update you, Jamie had a bunch of tests towards the end of the year, and they've all come back as, as she's completely cancer-free still, and we're just praising God for that still, and we're, we're thanking you. I want to thank so many of you that were praying for me and us, but I also want to say this. There's some of you, that's not the case right now. And you're in an uphill battle, and you need the mindset of perseverance and grit. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna have a mindset of grit, but you can't just have a mindset. That's not the only answer. Number two, here's what you have to have. You have to surround yourself with the no-quit team. Like, do you have a team around you when things get hard? They're like, you are not gonna quit. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one says this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we have to be surrounded by witnesses and people that are gritty, he says this, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. In other words, sometimes our troubles and the uphill is not because of the, what the world's throwing at us, it's because of what we're doing to ourselves. It's our own sinful nature and our own actions that have caused us to have an uphill life. And we have people around us that help us, why? And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. In other words, the only way to truly have perseverance is not just a mindset, it's to surround yourself with witnesses and people that would do this. When life gets hard for you, they come alongside you and hold you up when you can't hold yourself up. And you need people around you that have scars in their life the same way Jesus had scars on his hands to say this, hey, I've been through hard things too. I know what you're going through. And listen, together, we're gonna get through this. Do you have people like that in your life, like a no-quit team? Some of you have people in your life, but they're more like a quit team. You know what they are? They, you come to them with problems, they're like, oh, well, just walk away from him, or let's go to the bar and get wasted, right? That's the answer to your issues. I'm just being real, right? Or let's do something. Let's, the answer is a vacation. Or the answer, no, you need people that can walk alongside you and hold you up and get godly grit in your life, not just the world's opinions of what you should do. Like, you have to have godly people. In fact, I think one of the most beautiful pictures of this is in Exodus chapter 17, of people holding you up when you're not strong enough to hold yourself up. You just get exhausted. In Exodus chapter 17, what's going on is the Israelites are battling their arch nemesis, the Amalekites. And Moses has sent the Israelites off into battle. He's on a hill watching, and Scripture says that as long as Moses held his hands over his head, the army was winning. But when he got tired and his arms started falling down because he just got so tired, it says the army lost. Let me ask you something. You ever tried to hold your hands over your head or, or work over your head for a long period of time? It gets to a point where it is impossible. And so it's not that Moses doesn't have the right mindset. He, he wants to persevere. Sometimes you just get to a place where you're so physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, mentally exhausted that you want to give up. What is the answer when you get so tired and weary that you don't have the power on your own to persevere? What's the answer? Well, watch what happened to Moses. It says, Moses' arms, in verse 12, soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up because that's what happens in life sometimes. But watch this. Watch the next verse. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and they stood on each side of Moses, and what they do? Say it out loud. Holding his hands up. That is one of the most beautiful pictures of perseverance in all of Scripture. That when I am exhausted, and I don't have what it takes to keep persevering, I have godly men and women around me holding my arms up when I can't hold them up on my own. Do you have that kind of team? Do you have a David in your life that when you start walking through the darkest valley, 
You have a, a David-type person in your life that opens up Psalm 23 and reads to you and says, even though you walk through the darkest valley, you're gonna fear no evil because God is with you. His rod and staff will protect you through this season. And I know it's uphill, but together we're gonna get through this. You have someone like that in your life? Do you, do you have a Paul in your life? where when the shame of your past starts creeping in again and the pain of your past starts creeping in and you start to feel disqualified or inadequate for God ever using your life for something good in the future, you have a Paul that comes along and says, no, look at my life. We, we've all have stuff in our past and that doesn't disqualify you from God using you in your future. Do you have a Joseph in your life? That when you get in a pit because you've been betrayed by your family, even your friends, you have a Joseph that says this, hey, Satan intended this for evil, but God can use this for good as long as you forgive that person and you don't let bitterness sink into your heart like we talked about two weeks ago. Do you have people like that around you that are holding you up when you need it? I praise God for the people around me because I am not strong enough on my own, me. I need people like that holding my arms up. I, I thank God for... I have an executive team and leadership team here at the church. I couldn't even tell you the number of times they hold my arms up when I am so exhausted and tired. I'm just not sure what to do. I thank God for the elders of our church, godly, godly elders, who so many times when I'm frustrated or discouraged, they speak life and give life to me in ways that hold me up. Our small group, and we have friends in this church and people in this church that have done things for our family and you know who you are because you know what you've done for our family to help us persevere and give us grit. My wife, my family, they've held me up more times than I could ever imagine when my arms get weary from ministry. And in 2009, like when I, when I was like on the verge of do I walk away, I had people hold me up and I praise God for it. You have to have a no quit team so what are we gonna do? We're gonna set our mindset. We're gonna develop a no quit, surround ourselves with a no quit team, but then we have to have a third thing in our lives. And this may be the most important. And this is a principle that comes from Acts chapter 20, verse 34. I wanna read it to you. Here's what Paul says about his life. He says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news and about the wonderful grace of God. What I love about the Apostle Paul's life is outside of Jesus, I don't know someone in scripture that had to persevere maybe more to, to reach the assignment God had for him than Paul. I mean, he, you read about his life, he's shipwrecked, he gets sick, he's actually whipped and beaten at times to an inch of his life. That ever happened to you, not me? He's bitten by a snake. I think people think he's gonna die at some point. I mean, he's betrayed by his friends and people close to him. And yet, he goes on, in this verse he says, my life is worth nothing unless I, I finish the race God's assigned to me. He goes on in First Timothy, or Second Timothy chapter four, and he says this, I fought the good fight, I finished the race. He did it. Now, Paul finished his race. You haven't finished yours. How did Paul through all those trials and uphill living, how did he finish his race? Do you wanna know how he finished his race? It's, it's a phrase in this verse that so many people gloss over. It's because Paul wasn't running a race for himself. That's how he finished the race. He wasn't running a race for himself. What's he say? My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for running the race and finishing the race that God's given me. Here's the third principle. This is huge for someone today. You want perseverance? You have to run for something bigger than you. Now, I'm just, I mean, I'm just gonna get up in someone's grill today because you need it. The reason you're so exhausted, the reason you're so worn out, the real reason that you feel like quitting all the time is because you're not running a race for something bigger than you. You're running a race that is only about you. You, you know the biggest thing you're running for right now? This, this would like summarize kind of what you're running for in your life. You're running for comfort, personal comfort and convenience in your life. You're running a race for a financial nest egg or how big your salary can get or how big your you know, retirement can, account can get. Some of you are running a race for just pleasure. That is the only thing you're after 
is personal pleasure in your life. Some of you are running a race just to, for the opinions of others, like social media following and how many likes I get. That's the biggest thing your life is about right now. And I just want to say this for someone. If you're living for something this world can give you, you are not living the assignment God has for you. I want to say that again. If you're living for something this world can give you, you are not living the race God has for you, period. You're just not. In fact, you're living a race and trying to finish a race that may not be worth finishing. I mean, how would you have the grit needed if your only like, thing in life was comfort? That's not God's calling for you. He has bigger things than that for you. I mean, if your life's goal is to develop a nest egg for retirement and retire and sit around and do nothing, like, I'm sorry, that's not God's assignment for you. You need something bigger than that. And it's why at CCV, we're always encouraging you, like, get involved, get serving, use your life for something bigger than you. Start giving your financial resources, not just to your kingdom, but to build God's kingdom, because that has meaning, that has eternity in mind. Start inviting your friends and sharing your faith, because that actually has meaning, so no matter where you work, that's an assignment worth living for, sharing your life and your faith with other people around you. And again, some of you are like, well, man, it's easy for you to kind of get up on us, but like, of course, you're a pastor, so your life is like, you know, so much more meaningful than just you. And I just, again, I just want to be transparent. <laughs> I could easily start making this about me versus our church. I'm, I'm just being honest. And we, we don't talk about this a lot because I don't, I don't think it's, it's meaningful, nor should we talk about it much. But did you know that CCV today is one of the top five largest and most influential churches in the country today? It really is. And yeah, by the way, that's not, that's not to, I don't say that for you to clap for, I don't. And I, I'm, I love your, your energy, but that's not the reason I'm telling you. I'm telling you because what happens in an environment where God's doing so much at our church is there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of, that's a bigger platform. That's a lot of power that comes with that. And if I'm not careful, I could take all that and use it to build my platform instead of building the ministry of our church. You understand that there's opportunities that come up for me to go do other things or make money over here. And if I'm not careful, I'm just telling you, I can make this about me instead of the ministry of our church. And man, that scares me to death. Because by the way, anyone on this stage or anyone on our staff or who has influence here could do the same thing. And I'm just so proud of a church that wants to keep the main thing, the main thing, which is Jesus. And I want that to be my life. I want my life, what Paul said about himself, I want to say my life is worth nothing unless I use it for finishing the race of reaching this valley for Jesus Christ. That's what our church is all about. That's who we are, right? And, and I'm just... I want that to be my life. I don't want it to be about me, but I, I could do this too. We all could. We could run for something that's about us, not about God's kingdom. And who helps me with this the most is you. You may not know this, but when I travel around campuses and I talk to so many of you who are serving in so many ways, giving your life away and investing your finances in, in building God's kingdom, not your own, and just you inviting so many people, that encourages me because I want to be like that too. I want to live my life like that. And I know some of you email me, nasty emails, right? We talked about that. I love you still, all right? And if I change my hairstyle and it's, you don't like it, you can email Dave Stone, all right? Do you do that, all right? <laughs> but man, there's so many of you, do you know what you do? And you don't even know you do this for me. You're holding my hands up. You're an example to me the way you live your life in this church. Do you have people around you that are encouraging you, and are you challenging yourself to live a life bigger than just you? Otherwise, you'll quit. You'll quit if it's just about you. And I just wanna make a commitment to you publicly that I told you about 15 years ago, I thought about like quitting. And I just wanna say this, because I wanna be super clear, that you may see me struggle at times, you may see me get tired, but unless God or the elders tell me, like, it's time for you to leave, I am committed to this church, and when I commit, I will not quit. That's who I am. Do you have the same resolve 
and grit inside you to not quit. And whatever God's called you to, whether it's a marriage, your kids, or something he's told you about that you're just so tired about, you have to have grit. In fact, back in 1940, Harvard University did a study which now, 80 years later, has become the longest continuous study on human development and happiness, I think, in, the, in, in history. Um, what they did is, back in 1940, they took 268 sophomores, and they put them through some rigorous testing and questionnaires, and for 80 years now, many of them have passed away, but for, for 80 years, every two years, they would go interview all 268 of those sophomores, and they asked them about all the things we care about in life, right? Their career development, their marital satisfaction. They asked them about their mental health and their self-reported happiness and whether they were abusing drugs or you know, living a healthy lifestyle. And many of these 268 men, uh, one became president, many became senators, many became massive business leaders in our world. Some of them flamed out. Some of them quit life. Some of them just burned out. And what Harvard showed in the longest continuous study on human happiness that's ever been um, studied scientifically is they showed that when they took those 268 men initially and did testing on them, you want to know one of the tests they did on those men? They stuck them on a treadmill in incline. <laughs> they really did. They took, all, they, all, they took most of them and they, they took them on an incline and they, they told these men, they said, we want you to run on this for five minutes and they knew they could do it. They were physically fit to do it. They just wanted to know, did they have the grit to push through the pain and stay on it? Now I'm already exhausted, so I'm not sure I would have done on that test, you know? <laughs> but what they found is that some of them only lasted a minute and a half in incline. Some of them lasted, the average lasted four minutes, some of them made it all, all five minutes. But here's what they discovered. One of the highest correlated things over 80 years of the most successful men in that study, the most correlated thing was how long they lasted on that treadmill in incline. Because it's a rudimentary test of grit and your perseverance. When life gets uphill, can you push through? And God has someone here today to tell you, you're getting ready to quit. You're getting ready to quit a marriage, and there's a time when a marriage needs to be done because someone's gone off and done something and they're living with someone else. I, I understand that, but there's some of you here today, that's not the case in your marriage. You're just ready to quit because you think it should be easy with your kids, with a job, with a calling God has for you. You're ready to quit. Some of you here today, listen, there's someone here today, you're getting ready to end your life because you just think it's too hard. And God has you here to call you to something bigger and to develop grit inside you so that you can, you can meet your calling. You weren't designed for comfort. You were designed to live out the calling God has for you, which means what? It's gonna be uphill at times. And we're gonna set our mindset that everything I want in life that's worthwhile is uphill. So I will develop grit with Jesus inside of me. Same power that raised Jesus from the dead can help me get through anything. And I'm gonna surround myself with a no quit team. And then I'm gonna make sure I'm running a race that's bigger than just me. Do you need godly grit for whatever you're going through in life right now? If you do, listen, I'm gonna ask us all to stand on all of our campuses. You, you standing doesn't mean you're taking this declaration. I just want you to stand and if you want to make this declaration, draw a line in the sand, you say this out loud with me like you mean it. Here's our declaration for week seven. This year, with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, I declare, I will develop godly grit. Most people give up when life gets hard. I'm not most people. If I commit, I don't quit. Amen? Amen. Give yourselves a hand. Um, I want to I want to ask you to take a seat uh, for just a minute. Listen, we're we're wrapping up a seven week series we've been in for the last seven weeks, and in my opinion, it's been one of the most powerful series that I can remember in our church. 
I mean, I, I'm hearing from so many of you, God's doing things in your life because you are drawing a line in the sand and making some decisions that are life-changing. And so what I want to do right now as we close out this series, I want to give you a chance to cement one of those declarations. Listen, I hope, I hope all seven of those declarations play out in your life, but I want you to focus on one for the rest of the year. Because sometimes if you focus on everything, you focus on nothing. So which one do you need the most? And let me just review them really quickly, okay? You saw the video earlier. Week one, we talked about the declaration of consistency. And man, I'm so proud of some of you for developing consistency, whether being here at church every weekend and it's changing your life. It's transforming you or getting into God's word and you needed that one, right? The next week we talked about the idea of taking responsibility for my life, that I'm not gonna blame other people. The buck stops with me. And that may be the declaration you need this year. The next week we talked about wisdom and the, the independence and isolation of the wrong friends or the enemies of your growth. So I refuse to do life apart from godly community. And some of you still need to maybe get that godly community around you or get in a small group. And that may be your declaration for this year. The next week we talked about criticism. And I know this hit some of you hard because we won't let criticism crush us. We're gonna live for an audience of one. The, the fifth week of the series, we talked about a forgiving spirit, that we can't let bitterness destroy us, but we're gonna forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. Last week, we talked about joy, that we can have joy no matter our circumstances. We be joyful. And then this last week of the series, we talked about grit. Now, when you think about those seven, which one, just one, do you need the most this year? And as you exit the service today, um, in just a minute after I pray, our campus pastors are going to tell you how you can go get one of these bracelets. There's seven different bracelets. They say, I declare, and they have the declaration, each seven of them on there. And we're going to ask you, you can't get all seven, you can only get one. Some of you are like, I want all seven. Hey, develop some perseverance. You can't have it, okay? You get one. I want you to pick the one that you need the most. And you just pray and ask God, God, what do, what do I need? What do you want me to have this year? And you pick one up. And I'm gonna pray as we end this series that from this point forward, your life will never be the same. That there will be a line in the sand as with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, you declare, I declare. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've done in this series. We praise you for just the, the many declarations and decisions that, that many people have made. There's some marriages today they're being saved because of a declaration. God, there's someone with mental health or challenges with kids or their career or someone that was getting ready to walk away from their faith. And God, you're doing miracles in our midst. And so we just give you the credit. We give you the glory for that. And I just pray for everyone here that needs to pick up a bracelet to, to make this declaration really concrete in their life. God, I pray that people would wear these bands around as a reminder of them and that they'd also use them as reminders of, of sharing their faith with other people. When someone sees that band around their wrist and says, hey, what is that? They can just share what God's doing in their life and they can share what God can do in that person's life too and maybe get an invite to CCV. We thank you for this series and we just praise you now. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen, amen.